at the time I even had to, I was even bedwetting because of the circumstances that were there at home. My aunt used to beat me a lot. Beating me not for anything wrong that I have done, but just beating me for the sake of beating. I won't be given food. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been through the most. I am Ntodeni Shadrach Nenungui. I am a founder and the chairperson of Ntodeni Nenungui Foundation. I'm a physiotherapist uh, by profession. I practice in private practice. I am also a director of art for my own clothing range, the Craig Legs That Clothes. I am an author of the book entitled The Craig Legs That Closed. I was raised by a single mother. A single mother not by choice. Why do I say this? Because my father died when I was still very young. I suppose I was somewhere around the age between five and six. That is where the story started to turn sour. It was not nice to grow under such circumstances, wherein you are used to have both parents, your loving father and your loving mother, having everything at home, wherever that we needed at the time. Let me tell you that uh, I can safely say that we never um, say to ourselves that we were poor at the time, because my father managed to take care of uh, his household but things started to change immediately when my father uh, passed on because uh, after that there was a riot in the family wherein uh, they wanted to take they took almost everything um, from my mother and then we were also taken from her but that as it may we were shared amongst uh, my father's siblings I happened to go with one of my aunt. My elder sister stayed with uh, my uncle. Believe you me, I've been through the most. At that point in time, I was abused as a child. I was never allowed to go to school. I would go to be a hunter I would go to be a shepherd. I won't be given food to eat. At the time, I even had to, I was even bedwetting because of the circumstances that were there at home. My aunt used to beat me a lot. Beating me not for anything wrong that I have done, but just beating me for the sake of beating. I won't be given food. I used to survive by when I go out for hunting or I'm going into the, uh, uh, the bushes uh, for, um, for being a shepherd because I used to look after the goats. That is when I will at least get some wild fruits and then I would eat. That would be everything that I would eat. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't be given blanket. In winter, I used to sleep in a place where we call it a chitanga in my own language, where they do fire. So I would wait up until everyone else goes in and sleep. When they go in to sleep, what I would do is I would take a what I, I, I would remove the ashes and the coals where the fire was and I would take water just to dampen the place and make it a little bit cooler. That is where I would sleep, at least to get a little bit of warmth just from there. I did not have clothes. At the time, I was all my clothes were taken and they were given to um, one of my cousins. My mother came because she was told of the bad punishment uh, of the bad life that we were, we were living and the bad conditions that we're living in. And she asked my uh, grandfather if she could take us. And uh, fortunately enough, she came to fetch us. 
I had sores all over the body. I still remember even some of uh, my peers at that time, they used to call me uh, Job, like the one in the Bible, because they said he used to have sores all over his body. That's how I used to. I had malnutrition. People, they call it kwashioko. My tummy was like big like that. And I used to have, like my hair used to be like it's flying. I was very, very thin. And then after that, my mother took us. Not that she had everything sorted out. No, she didn't. But life was better when we were under her care, unlike with our aunt. Because um, at the time, they used to actually uh, go out to abuse us. Let me take you um, through here. It happened that at the time when I was supposed to go to school, I didn't because I was supposed to look after the goats. So when I went to my mother, she took us, uh, she took me to school. I did not have clothes, like a school uniform. She would ask for the school uniform from my cousins. My uncle, she would go talk to my uncle and my uncle would go like, no, you can use um, Mbilu's uh, uh, uniform. Mbilu is my cousin, he has passed on, may his soul rest in peace. He was even bigger than I am. So I would be wearing a very big um, a short and a very big shirt to school. So my mother, what she would do is she would come at the edge and sew it um, with a different color of um, a, a, a thread. Whether it's green or yellow, whichever that she would have at the time. And as years progresses, that is when she will cut it at the, and still manage to sew it. I did not have a lunch, a lunch box or even a school bag. What she used to do was she used to take um, a sack of milli meal and she would do a just a school bag out of it. Not only um, the sack of milli meal, even the, uh, the rice uh, bag, we also used to, to use that one. My legs used to be very cracked. I used to have what we call mahojane and makwanda. The reason why I brought in these sneakers today is for, so that you could see here how my legs would be more or less uh, looking like. It was like makwanda, the crease that you can see here. It was more or less something like, like that all over and also um, around here. Because one, we did not uh, even have a, a Vaseline that we would use. So what mainly they would do is when they had slaughtered a, a do you call it a pig? Yeah. Um, or pork, or is it pork when it's dead? Yeah. They would slaughter a pig. And then after they had fried, they would take a, a, the fats coming from a, a, a pig. And then we would use it at least uh, to make sure that um, our legs and feet looks like. I grew up, as I grew up, my mother used to be, uh, she was doing everything. She would go from house to house for odd jobs. You know, some of the jobs that she used to do at the time, it was termed that this is, uh, this is, this, this is the kind of a job that is mainly done by um, a man. But there was no job that she wouldn't take just to make sure that uh, we are supported and we have the back of millimeter just behind uh, our door. My sister, I remember some of the story that uh, when I, I was doing standard three, they call it grade um, uh, five now. When I went to um, the initiation school, all my, all the kids around our area, 
they were going to initiation school. So I, I did not, it did not sit well with me that when everyone else is going, I'm the only one that is not going. So I decided to go there by myself. Obviously at the time they used to call it Oshavela, like you, and you did not have permission. Even though you did not have permission, they will still take you in. So they used to pay a lot of money for that. My sister decided to get married at a very young age to make sure that um, I am actually um, supported when I was on the other side. This is the story that um, when I look at it and I was like, it was really bad. I came back. My mother went to um, to Pretoria to work in the as a domestic worker. I had to remain home to look after my siblings. It it was not easy, but at least we would get money coming from um, my mother almost every month. The very first time that I could say at least life was better because we could even eat um, eggs, you know, fried eggs, uh, plus the tin fish. That used to be luxury, believe you me. Um, yeah. And then at the time, um, when she came back, our grandmother, we, we also had a, a grandmother uh, who was at least uh, getting a uh, grant even though she was getting the the grant the money was not uh, enough you know i still remember in the year 2000 when there was heavy rain during those rain all the houses at home because they were mud houses they all collapsed i did not have any uh, anywhere to sleep actually everyone at home so there was a gentleman not very far from our house he had uh, his house which was not finished but it was made of um, cement he said uh, we can go in there it was a one bedroom house so we took uh, the zinc from the fallen mud house and then we went to make sure that we make them as windows in that house everyone else moved in there so because i was now at my teen age it was very difficult for me to share a bedroom with my siblings and uh, my mother and my sister it was very difficult to do that so instead i was taken in by one of my friend uh, ndivo matumba he took me in i went stayed in his house he had a randafel even though it was not the best of it, but it served the purpose at the time. At the time, we used to sleep in the same Randavel house with goats and chicken. As you are still sleeping and enjoying your sleep, you would hear a cock crawling. <laughs> then now that used to be our alarm and we had to actually um, wake up um, before i could go further i would like to say to you i also had peer pressure at the time i remember i used to sniff a uh, glue we used to steal uh, bottles so that we can go and sell so that we are able to get the money to feed uh, our habit and we would go sell them just across the river at a place called Chino. So we would walk a very long distance to do that. They will get our glue and also manage to play the arcade game on the other side. So when we come back, we have to fire through the fields of other people where they are growing their crops. We would go there, start stealing from uh, those people there. So they realize that they are purples, they are... Um, uh, sugar canes, they are getting finished. 
because we would just go there and uh, just cause havoc just for the sake of it. I don't know why, but most probably it could have been the influence of uh, what we've been sniffing at the time. So I, one of these good days, I was going up a tree, a purple tree with my friend. As I was going up, I just see him running. He did not tell me to say, hey, my friend, we are in trouble. At the time, when my friend was running, when I looked, they were actually the owners of, the, of that uh, 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 field. They were coming, running to us. When I jumped off, unfortunately, I was caught. This is where the story of my life started to turn around. At the time when I was caught, I was taken to the chief. And uh, the chief and everyone else, a meeting was called for everyone who belongs there. They say, we have caught the thief. Everyone come. Everyone was there. They had a very big drum which was filled with cement. That drum, all the offenders, what they do is they have to tie you around that thing and everyone else without wearing anything here on, on your back. Everyone else must just come with a sambok and beat you. That's how it used to be. So after they caught me, the meeting was called. Even my mother was called into a meeting and she was asked, that we, we caught your son doing stealing and then for now it's up to you. The damages that you have to pay, it's 150 rand. At the time, 150 rand was a lot of money. Or else your son received the beating. My mother said, um, I don't have money, but I will work for it. At the time, I saw the tears on my mother's uh, eyes rolling out. That was the turnaround of uh, the story of my life. Sorry about that. And she, she said, I will work for it. And those people, and she, she pleaded with everybody there to say, can you actually give me the job? so that I can work and pay for what my son did. And after that, everyone gave her something to do. And whatever that she would get, the money, she won't be, the money won't be given to her. It would be taken to the chief. That's when I started to work with my mother because I saw the love and the pain that she was going through at the time. I became very close with her. I decided to leave everything else and work with her. After school, I would go and work with her up until we raised the money. The money was raised and then we managed to pay off uh, the debt. And we still continued because at the time, we were still we still had other jobs that we were doing like plowing and weeding and making other people's uh, fields look nice and okay and even irrigating that's what we used to do so i became a better person from that day i stopped the sniffing of uh, the glue i went to church the story of my life turned around and that is where I started to realize that there was actually no one in my family who has the degree that's when I've made a prayer I still remember uh, my then pastor uh, Dr. Ndanduleni uh, Mudau of the Rivers of Life Ministries Cathedral in Venda he preached a message. It was something that has to do with um, generational curses. At the time, I was so scared and I heard like the message was really talking to me to say there are things that I needed to cut. In my spirit, I wanted to succeed so much that I can change the life of where I come from. 
because it was at that time that I realized that uh, the poverty in our home, it was too much. Because the church that I used to go to, it was a charismatic church. When you go there, everyone else is nicely dressed. You see, at the time we used to call it dress to bless, but not to kill. People used to dress, they were looking stunning and immaculate. And I did not have anything to dress. And that, that's when I realized that even people who were poor in our village, they did not see themselves poor. But they saw us poor because they were actually saying we are poor than them. That's when I've made a decision to say I will be the first person in my family to go to the university and get a university degree. And I had to work for it. I was smart in class. I became leader, a leader in my high school level. I was um, a deputy um, a president of the LRC at the time. After passing, going to the university, I went to the University of Venda for Science and Technology. I had passed my metric really well because I had groups of students which were encouraging one another. The university did not even uh, think twice but to take me into the program of physiotherapy. I used to stay at home, wake up very early in the morning. I'm not a morning person, but I would wake up early in the morning for the bus. Sometimes you will wait, you see it when it's still far around Chin or there, to say, okay, there it is. Then you know that it's gonna be at the bus stop before you arrive. You can, re you can look at this. A whole university student running for the bus without roll on. When you get inside the bus, you are already um, not smelling very nice. And you are going to be in front with the other, uh, uh, to be amidst uh, other students. And then at the time, I, I used to make sure that I am very smart and try to make sure that I need to be smart in order to actually change um, the, the course of my family. I used to be a class prefect of almost all the classes. Beside that, I would write people assignment and then they would give me money. I would make photocopies of notes of the notes that we used to do in class. Sometimes I would even go to an extent of typing it. You see, there was one other um, a friend of mine at the time. I was so happy recently that uh, she has been appointed in one of these big universities. She's up there. I used to do assignment for her. I won't mention her, just in case. <laughs> they would now say they need the certificate. <laughs> Yeah, she sent me a message recently to say, look, guess what? This is uh, what I'm doing, you see. And by doing that, I was actually encouraged as well, you know. We found out when we were supposed to, when we were doing our third year at the University of Venda, that um, the course physiotherapy that you are doing with the University of Venda it is actually not registered with the health, with HPCSA, Health South African HPCSA, Health Council of South Africa. Yeah. So, the HPCSA came to the University of Venda and told them that uh, you cannot continue to train students because we did not accredit your course. The main issue, it was anatomy and physiology, which uh, the University of Venda was, uh, they did not have at the time. Though we were going to a university of the North called Tefluop to do anatomy and physiology there because anatomy and physiology at the University of the North, it was accredited. So the university took it, um, uh, they 
took it to make sure that we go there. But it was uh, like some sort of uh, politics which was playing there, toying with the student lives, trying to punish the leaders. We, we were stopped and we were told to go to Medunsa, Medical University of South Africa. When we get to Medunsa, ladies and gentlemen, we were told that unfortunately we cannot take you to the level that you, are, that you were from your previous university. You need to start afresh. This was very, very painful. And even when we left Medunsa, the fact when we left a university of Venda, it was very sad because uh, we were told that we are going to start on our second year. So that alone, it demoralized a lot of our student and made our student to be more, um, some of them, they were depressed because I remember there were about two students who even at the time attempted suicide. There was another student who at the time, she even literally, she got uh, mentally uh, deranged because of the pre because of uh, the whole situation. You know, we were taken to Medunsa by a bus. When we arrived there in Medunsa, Medunsa said, "No, unfortunately, your university was not accredited. You have to start from scratch." One thing that I failed to tell you when I was still at the University of Venda was that. Our first year, I was um, excluded from um, the university because of finances. Um, the University of Venda um, gave the circular to all the departments to say all students who are not registered are no longer allowed in the lab, they are no longer allowed in the library, so they are actually excluded even though the SRC at the time they were trying their best to negotiate for us but it did not work. I left to go work in the mines because um, we were it was roughly around Easter uh, when we were uh, excluded and then I went to Rustinburg where my uncle was working with my cousin. When I got there I decided to Actually, there was a job which was ready for me. I was told that I am highly educated because I, I had metric. And I was like, hey, what? Yes. They say, okay, you are going to be um, a clerk. At the time, like everyone else who comes in, when you take the equipment, uh, I need to put them down, register for them, and then if there is this and that, that needs to be done. Like when they come in to clock in at work, I used to be the one um, who's holding books, and then from there I will send it to the schedule to the person who will be making um, their salaries. So it was very interesting for me to do that. Um, I had actually um, had actually lost hope. But uh, my um, pastor, Pastor Mudao, gave me a phone call. He said to me, Ntodeni, uh, where are you? Because we have not seen you in church for the past three weeks. I said, no, I'm not around. He said, where are you? He said, I'm in Rustinburg. What are you doing there? I'm working. You're working? How about school? I said, I've quit school. Why? Because I don't have money to register you see they said he said how much is the money that you need to register i said 690 because i got tefsa uh, tefsa it was uh, equivalent to nefsas nefsas just changed the name from um, tefsa to into nefsas so tefsa gave me um, a portion of uh, the tuition. So uh, Pastor Mudau um, at the time decided to send the money. I still remember very well. It was 1,000 rand. That money was sent into my cousin's account because I personally did not have a bank account at the time. My mother had 
tried everything else in order to raise the money. She went to our relatives, she went to our family friends, kneeling down, asking for help. No one helped us. That is why the decision of leaving um, a school to go and try and work to raise the money myself. So at the time, um, I came back into the university and I did very well because I, I had passion to succeed. You see, passion is a push that comes from within. You don't have to be given it by anyone else. You see, that's how I defined it to say, I need to push myself in order to achieve that which I wanted to achieve. Because at the time I was even crying. My cry was, God, this is going to be um, the failure of the prayer and the agreement that you and I had a vow and a promise that we have made unto each other to say I will be the first person in my family to have a degree. And I saw my dream crumbling down where I was now at lack. But I went back to school. I did very well. I passed everything else except um, biology. The reason why I failed biology is because if you miss three practicals, automatically you fail for that semester. But the other subject, I passed them very well. I was given the vice chancellor's scholarship for doing better that year by the then vice chancellor of the University of Venda, Geslang Kondo. He gave me that uh, scholarship. I did very well. That money, I took it, had to pay for the 50%, which uh, TEFSA was not paying to the university. The other amount of money, it was left for me to eat at the cafeteria, at the University of Venda. Eating at the cafeteria at the time was a luxury. You know, holding, coming out, holding that white uh, foam plate like this, ah, it was an achievement. I was amongst those. But this was happening towards um, the end of the year. And the amount which was left, it was carried over to register me to the following year at the university. So coming back to us uh, being taken to Medunsa and being told that um, we are going to start afresh, it was really um, a devastating moment. I was a leader of our students when we get to when we go to the university um, uh, to Medunsa. I negotiated on behalf of uh, our students to say, okay, you are saying that uh, the University of Venda is not registered with the HPCSA, the Health Professions Council of South Africa. So this means that uh, the courses which they did not register with the Health Professions Council of South Africa, it means that there are those which are registered, which are out of the School of Health Sciences, which you, you can credit us for. And indeed, uh, by then, the principal, uh, Bomela, he agreed to um, our um, request and then some of the courses we were accredited. And then fortunately enough, we had to work very hard. Believe you me, the year which we were transferred to Medunsa, that year I was going to be excluded financially again because they now said that uh, TEFSA was going to give us 25% because there are so many students. So they, we, we had to share the money amongst uh, everyone of us. So we were going to get 25%. So to me, escaping from um, University of Venda to Medunsa, even when it had um, an impact in terms of the number of years 
which we're going which actually you will never regain back to me it was some sort of a relief because the agreement which we had with the university of venda was that they have to pay for our tuition for our accommodation for our books and for our meals up until we conclude our degree with uh, Medunza. So the fact that I'm no longer going to worry about the finances, that was a major relief to me. Not looking at the number of years which, um, we, were which we had already lost. Because some of my colleagues, like my classmate, they were now working and I used to envy them a lot. So I worked very hard in Medunza. I became a little bit uh, popular. Um, I was a poet. Yeah, when I got there, I used to confuse them with, um, with words, like poetry permit poor poet, playing painting poems in poetry for people. And people used to go like, what? And I would repeat that. That ladies and gentlemen, I am saying in terrier, with the poem entitled. People used to love me for that. I, I became very popular for the narrative uh, like that. Like it is not a sin to repeat the truth. Things like that used to be um, my motto. Like ladies and gentlemen, I am the dynamic dynamite anointed poet, the bold bona fide born again Christian, presenting to you the anointed gospel. Ah, Jesus. Gone are those days before I had this airbag. By then, um, I was building myself towards where I wanted to be. I became popular to such an extent that uh, through a student Christian fellowship, at Medunza, I was then also nominated to um, to be uh, in the SRC, which was a very great relief for me because at the time you would be you would get refund uh, if you are in the SRC. You get you pay fifty percent, and then I had a bursary from the University of Venda, and then at the time I also applied for the bursary from. Um, uh, Department of Health in Limpopo. So I had uh, the scholarship from University of Venda. I had the bursary from University uh, from uh, Department of Health. I got a financial cut from um, the SRC participation and all that. That made my life so easy to such an extent that by so doing, then I started to build at home. When I was still at the university to change the situation around because you know what I was aggrieved by the manner in which things were happening at home and one of my motto as I was growing up was that I want to punish poverty because what poverty has done in my life in my family it was something bad so that is when I decided to build at home starting to change here and there and things started to look a little bit better. I would wear even uh, the designer clothes. Yeah, na wo Nike at the time, you know, that used to be nice. I passed and I became a physiotherapist. Being a physiotherapist was a dream come true to me. As I took the oath at Medunza, at the hall, I shed a tear because that was um, an agreement or a vow or a promise that God has actually fulfilled in my life. You know, and I look back right now, I'm like, God, the reason why we were even into this turmoil for us to get the degree was it because I was like Jonah 
inside the boat. Other people had to suffer because of me. But I thank God that as we speak now, I am doing well. In my life, I am doing well in business. I am doing well as a father. I am doing well recently. I have authored a book entitled The Craig Legs That Closed. And this book was released in the month of August. Um, I don't know if English will allow that do I call it a tribute to my mother or an appreciation to my mother who has been there throughout and never given us um, any reason to actually give up in life. Even though the situation was bad, she used to encourage us with the word that says, my kids, poverty will never, ever kill you but it will torment you. It is up to you at the time of torment, whether you want to give up or you want to stand up and do that which will make you a better person tomorrow. That is what she would always, always tell us. And indeed, we listened. And for now, in this month, I want to celebrate her to say um, she has done well to raise us from nothing. I am here to tell somebody to say I have been through a lot. Your story may never be as close to what I have been as a person. So, be that as it may, ladies and gentlemen, your story can also turn around. It depends on the passion and the zeal and the oomph that you have and that which you want to achieve in life. You can turn things around in your family, in your environment. It is never too late. The Bible that I read says a living dog is better than a dead lion. The fact that you are still alive you can make a massive difference in your life and in the lives of people around you. What am I saying? Have I arrived? No. I am still going. Just as Paul said, I am looking ahead and forging ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, I have been through a lot. Thank you.